welcome everybody on this fine <laughs> winter evening. Um, I was in Florida just a few days ago. And I got, got, <laughs> gotta say, it's just a little bit warmer there. Um, anyway, thank you all for joining us for our program tonight, uh, White Man's Paper Trail, Extinguishing Indigenous Land Claims in Missouri with author Greg Olson. Um, I'm John Brenner. I'm the managing editor for the State Historical Society and our journal, the uh, Missouri Historical Review. Uh, our program tonight is actually part of a two different uh, programming series that we offer, um, both of which are connected to the review. So uh, we're bringing them both to you tonight for the price of one. Um, first, it is part of our Missouri Historical Review author series, which we started uh, last year as a, an online series um, when, when we were dealing with all the social restrictions during the, the pandemic. Uh, so tonight's actually the first time we've had a live in-person presentation. Um, like the previous talks, though, we'll be recording this one and, and all the videos are available on our on-demand programs page on our website um, at shsmo.org. Um, tonight's talk also is part of a longer running program that we offer, uh, the Center for Missouri Studies Fellowships, which uh, support uh, scholars financially, provide the chance to uh, publish their work in, in the review, and also to give a public presentation of their work uh, like tonight. And Greg Olson was um, one of our fellows in 2020. Um, that year we were um, asking for projects uh, related to the bicentennial um, um, and the, the time period uh, around the Missouri statehood in 1821. So uh, as you'll see here in a little bit, um, Greg's uh, study uh, covers the sort of surprisingly long and complicated process by which the United States um, worked treaties with uh, numerous uh, Native American nations to um, acquire legal claim to all the land that is now Missouri. Um, okay, well, it's my, my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Greg Olson has an impressive list of accomplishments as an author, especially of Native American history. Uh, now retired from the Missouri State Archives, where he was the curator of exhibits and special projects, Greg lives in Columbia and continues to be a prolific independent scholar. Uh, over the past 20 years or so, he has written half a dozen books, uh, including The Iowa in Missouri, which received the Missouri Humanities Council Governor's Award for Literary Achievement in 2009. And I checked next door, our, our, our bookstore has some copies of the book. If they are not still open tonight, uh, we also have an online store and it's available there too. Um, Greg also has published numerous articles, including several in the review. In uh, his article, Navigating the White Road, White Cloud Struggled to Lead the Iowa Along the Path of Acculturation, won the Society's Best Article Award in 2005. And then just last summer in our July issue, Greg published um, White Man's Paper Trail, which forms the basis for tonight's talk. Uh, that article is part of a larger book project that Greg is working on for the University of Missouri Press, um, a comprehensive history of the Native American experience in Missouri. Um, and we can all look forward to reading that, uh, it sounds like sometime next year. Um, okay. Please welcome Greg Olson. Thank you, John. Um, I want to thank the Historical Society first for inviting me to come uh, and speak tonight and also uh, for their support of my scholarship through the fellowship that John mentioned. Um, that was, I was very gratified to receive that. This talk is bookended by two paintings, the first John Gass, American Progress, I think from around 1875 just sort of typifies some of the um, optimism of, uh, of the American pioneer spirit or whatever you would want to call it. And you see uh, uh, 
the allegorical figure of progress leading the pioneers across the plains. And I don't know if you can see, but the natives are kind of shirking off in the, in the, in the darkness on the other side. So I want to talk basically, I call them myths, and maybe myth is too strong of a word, but I want to talk about two misunderstandings that we have about Missouri history. And the first misunderstanding is that Missouri, or the, rather the United States purchased Louisiana in 1803 for $15 million. After all, we do call it the Louisiana Purchase. But in reality, we did not buy the land. This is a quote from historian Colin Calloway who says that uh, the sale, the Louisiana Purchase, actually did not uh, convey the land itself, but the preemptive right to negotiate with the indigenous people for title to the land. So in other words, um, all this land in Louisiana was still owned by somebody else. The United States simply, we had preemptive um, authority to treat with all of the tribes for that land. And in fact, it would take 222 separate land sessions that would go from 1804 all the way up to 1970 at a total cost. And this is um, uh, based on some work done by Bobby Lee, who has uh, talked about the cost of the Louisiana Purchase. He came up with a figure of $2.6 billion adjusted for inflation, $8.5 billion. And that's still a pretty good deal. The second myth or misunderstanding is that the state of Missouri was founded on land to which the U.S. held legal claim. Wrong again. Uh, at the time that we became a state in 1821, only two indigenous nations had ceded any rights to the state of, uh, to land in the state of Missouri. And um, that was the Osages who have session number, what is that, 67 in the bottom. They ceded in 1808 most of the land south of the Missouri River. And then up in the corner here by Shel Shelbyville and between there and the Mississippi River, the Sac and Fox, um, uh, well, ceded, I'm gonna use air quotes there, land in, in 1804. Uh, the ink on the uh, Louisiana Purchase Treaty was barely dry when that, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, that was a, certainly a contested treaty. Um, so it would take the United States more than 20 treaties with 13 indigenous nations before gaining title to all of the land, and um, the, we did not own the land free and clear until um, what would that be, 16 years after, after we became a state. I'm going to shuffle some papers here. Um, and, and so what gave us the right, why, what did, why did we think we could do this? What was the basis of us owning native land and us feeling that we had the right to um, to come in, permanently settle on this land, and then um, move indigenous people off of it. And it goes back to uh, something that's called the doctrine of discovery. And that is a medieval, uh, uh, basically it comes from the Christian church. It's a, a, a medieval uh, thought, a medieval theory. Some say it's based on uh, Genesis 128, in which God tells Abraham to subdue the earth, exercise domain over all living things. And so in the Middle Ages, the popes remember, and some of the monarchies in Europe uh, started to think that, you know, uh, we, are, we as Christians are living the divine life. We are treating the land. We are subduing the land. We are living on the land the way God wants us to live on the land. And the so-called infidel nations, who is pretty much anyone other than those of us who are Christians, are not. They are not using the land in the way God intended. They are not occupying it in the way that God intended. And so, as Christians, it is our job to go around the world and fulfill God's will by moving the infidels off the land and winning it over for Christianity. 
Um, this was important to, uh, actually, it, in the Middle Ages, it was first exercised in the Middle East, Northern Africa, as European powers went off and this age of discovery started. Um, but in uh, this hemisphere, it was exercised by Christopher Columbus, who landed in the Caribbean, sailing for Spain under the flag of the Spanish monarchs, and claimed the land he was on for the king and queen of Spain. When Columbus got back to Europe then, Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain, contacted the pope and they said, we sent this guy over, okay? And he discovered this land. Um, we want in on this action. And so a papal bull came out a couple of years after that and it said that Spain and Portugal both had the right to divide up the world and to conquer and gain it for Christians. Now this is kind of interesting because this doctrine of discovery to this day is the basis of what we call Indian law. Any kind of law that relates to native tribes and land, um, we, uh, it's still based on the doctrine of discovery as codified by uh, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall in the 1830s. Uh, let's see, a case called uh, Johnson v. McIntosh, and Marshall said that, that uh, when a European Christian nation discovers a new land, that nation automatically gains what, what they called right of ownership to that land, all right? But the natives continued to have what's called right of occupancy. So the, the, way, the only way I can really comprehend this is that all of the sudden, indigenous people in Missouri had a new landlord after the Louisiana Purchase were signed, okay? They could live on the land as long as they wanted to, but if they wanted to sell the land, they could only sell it to the United States. And you would ask, well, why would native people want to sell their land? Um, as soon as the, as soon as the uh, American government, uh, became, as soon as we became a nation, we started treating with the nation, with an, uh, indigenous tribes and basically came up with two different ways that we could convince native people to give up land, some of, sometimes land that they had lived on for centuries. And the first way of doing that was by uh, a lot of times, when white settlers moved in, this definitely happened in Missouri, but it happened, it's happened all over the country before Missouri and after, that white settlers would move into a new opened up area and regardless of not whether native people live there and regardless of or not whether the United States owned that land or the native people owned that land, the settlers would um, you know, flood the area and sometimes the settlers became so numerous and so troublesome that indigenous people would actually say, look, we got to get out of here. Let's, could we have some land farther west? Uh, things are just getting too complicated. There's too many settlers. And there's also native people from other parts of the country moving in because they're getting pushed out by settlers in other areas. And so this land is really no longer our own so they would agree to sell it through treaty. The second way that they could be persuaded to get rid of their land is by incurring debt. And as the United States began becoming more engaged in indigenous policy, they set up uh, what were called trading factories. And uh, this was true definitely in Missouri. There was a trading factory at Fort Osage run by George Sibley. And the indigenous people around Fort Osage were legally only supposed to trade with George Sibley at that, um, at that trading factory, trading post. And of course, when there's no competition, then George Sibley could, add, could uh, charge whatever he wanted to for the goods that the native people increasingly needed to live on, to, to have to live. And so he would charge them, and not just George Sibley, but all over the country, the agents would charge them exorbitant amounts so that by the end of the year, generally, the natives were in debt. And even if they were receiving annuities 
from uh, previous land sessions that they'd gotten money from, they would, they, they would, you know, as soon as those annuities got paid over, the trader was always right next to the agent, the Indian agent at the table, and generally he would get the, the money first, and the natives would find themselves without enough money to survive for the coming winter. So um, that's another way they could be persuaded. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson understood this uh, early on in the history of the U.S. is that native people don't have money, but they have land. And if we can get them to owe money, we can have their land. And so how did they do that? Um, through trading, uh, th treaty councils. This is a picture of the, um, uh, the Treaty Council of, a uh, Portage de Sioux Treaty Council of 1815 along the Mississippi River. And this was not a council that um, gave land. This was not a land session council. This was a council of peace. And it was, um, it was uh, William Clark of Lewis and Clark fame who became the Indian agent in Missouri. It was his treaty to try to mend up some of the hard feelings that had, in, that had come up during the War of 1812. And so it was, a, it was a huge treaty. I think that there were probably a couple of thousand different indigenous people from this part of the country. And uh, you can see there are soldiers. Um, there were, at that time, 250 soldiers uh, watching over the proceedings as well as a couple of gunboats sailing up and down the Mississippi River. So there was, there, it, they were, ve were often very militaristic. The treaty councils were rarely uh, even-handed. You know, uh, if they could do it, the uh, government officials would put the native people in a situation where they felt intimidated. There are reports sometimes of, of uh, well, it was quite common actually for the federal government to give the indigenous people who were um, engaged in, from the delegations engaged in the treaties, they would receive gifts, they would receive often liquor, you know, to help kind of grease the skids of, of treaty making. And then there was always or often a military presence to sort of uh, convey the seriousness, you know, and also show the might of, of treaties. Treaties were often held here in Missouri um, or in, in this area as this uh, Portage de Sioux Treaty was. Sometimes, though, they would be held in Washington, D.C., and that was a whole other thing where they would, you know, if, if they really wanted to impress uh, a certain delega delegation with the might of America and power, they would send them to Washington, D.C., where they would show them soldiers, they would show them factories, they would show them shipyards, you know, they'd put them up in nice hotels, give them nice clothing, and just sort of overwhelm them. I guess shock and awe, maybe, uh, is a phrase that could be used. Um, and in Missouri, not only was uh, William Clark a treaty agent, an American agent, but also Pierre Choteau of the Choteau families, who not only, the Choteaus not only traded extensively with the Osages, and with the Osages helped to make St. Louis the market center that it was, but they also intermarried with the Osages, which is something we can, we can talk about later. Um, and I wanna mention, if I haven't already, that to this day, only federal agencies can uh, enter into legal agreements with tribes that have to do with land, okay? Treaties were conducted, were conducted in the United States from 1783 until uh, 1869. There were something like 300 treaties uh, that were ratified by the Senate, and those could only be conducted by the federal government. They couldn't be conducted by state government. And to this day, federal government uh, still has control over native, native Indian policy, Indian law. One of the reasons I got interested in this topic, years and years ago, people would ask me, so who, who lived here? You know, what, which native tribes lived here? And that really depends on when you uh, are talking about. 
Um, because people have lived here, conservatively we say people have lived here for 12,000 years, although I think we're going to find out as more archaeologists <laughs> dig into this, that people have lived here far longer than 12,000 years. There are sites in Missouri with carbon dating coming up to uh, 15,000 years. And I think, I think it's, we're going to find out at some point that people lived here even before the first or the most recent ice age, which would be 23, 24,000 years ago. That's just my, I'm not an archaeologist, but that's my opinion from reading what archaeologists are saying. So the point of that is people have lived here a long time. They've always been moving. They've always been traveling. They never rarely lived in one place for long. I mean, just each of us think about the area where we live today. You know, how long have we lived in our present place? How long have our neighbor, how often do we see neighbors move? Okay, people are always moving. And, and you know, usually it's for the same reason, for a better job, a better lifestyle maybe nicer neighbors, a nicer neighborhood, and that's uh, the same reason that indigenous people were always moving. I've chosen 1673 here because that is generally uh, cited as the first date that European people stepped foot in Missouri, and that was Marquette and Joliet on the Missouri River. Um, there's some thought that perhaps uh, DeSoto's people may have visited the Boot Hill in, 14, in 1541, but nobody can prove it. So anyway, we choose 1673 as the date of uh, first contact. So we're about right here. And we were at that point kind of in the um, sort of the overlap of three different uh, big indigenous powers. Here you have the Osages, which um, the Osages were actually made up of many smaller groups, clans, and groups. Um, the Europeans divided them in their minds into the Little Osages and the Great Osages. Okay, but in really the Osages at that time controlled a lot of what's now Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, and so er definitely everything under uh, below the Missouri River. Along the Mississippi River, you had the Illinois Confederacy, and that is as many as maybe 17 different small tribes, um, the Kaskaskias, the Miamis, the Peorias, the Cahokias, tribes you may have heard of today. Uh, those are the ones that come to mind anyway. And they were uh, really held down the M Mississippi River and controlled a lot of the trade on the Mississippi River, and uh, the Peorias actually were people that lived up here that uh, uh, Marquette and Joliet met with. And then the third really big mega power were, were the Missourias. They were allied with the Little Osages, and they lived up uh, Van Meter State Park is the site of a major Missouri village. But they controlled trade up from, you know, up on the what would be the upper Miss Missouri River. Then you had groups like the Odos, the Iowas, um, the uh, Chickasaws and the Quapaws, who essentially lived elsewhere but would wander into Missouri for hunting. Okay, that was a situation during first contact, but by the time of the Louisiana Purchase, you had actually quite a different situation. The Missourias, uh, are no, no longer here. They were uh, basically annihilated in a series of battles with, among others, the Sac and Fox. And so they moved with the Osages up into what's now Nebraska. Then you have, uh, or with the Odos, I'm sorry. The Osages are still holding down this area, but they have moved farther south Okay, the Little Osages, when the Missouri is left, they moved down. The Great Osages, uh, thanks in large part to Pierre Choteau and some political uh, maneuvering he had been working on with the um, Osages, had, had split into two different groups, two different factions. Um, the absence of the uh, Missourias allowed the Iowas and the Sac and Fox to move in from the further north. And the uh, Illinois Confederacy had also been pretty much, uh, their power had been taken away through co combat and conflict. 
And then uh, the Quapaws are still down here. Uh, they are mostly living in Arkansas, but are coming up here to do some hunting and things. Quapaw, or the Chickasaws are really no longer here. But you have a kind of an interesting situation where you have three what are called immigrant tribes coming into Missouri. Um, the Shawnee and Delaware were invited to be here by the Spanish, as were the Kickapoos, and they came in the late 1700s. Um, Spain was trying to occupy, uh, the, the, uh, their, when Spain owned Missouri, they were trying to occupy it, and they found that having the Shawnees and Delawares and the Kickapoos down here was kind of helpful because it kept the Osages away from Spanish um, Spanish villages and Spanish habitations. So um, they invited them in to help populate the area, but also to act as sort of a de facto police force to keep them separate from the, from the Osages. Okay, so we're going to play a quick um, blackout, Missouri blackout here. All right, I talked a little bit about this uh, Sack and Fox 1804 treaty was con conducted with Benjamin, uh, no, uh, William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison, who was a general, he had uh, treated with different tribes in the east, and he was um, the governor, territorial governor of Illinois, and briefly acted as territorial governor of what was then called Upper Louisiana, of which Missouri was a part. But 1804, not just a, a few months after the Louisiana Purchase uh, or the transfer of power in St. Louis, um, he convinced Osages, or uh, Sack and Fox, who really had no authority to sign a treaty. They were simply in St. Louis because there had been a crime committed up around Troy, Missouri by, by some Sack and Fox and, and some low-level chiefs went to St. Louis to try and straighten it all out and, and bring the guy in for his punishment. Harrison brought them into treaty, may or may not have given them a, a great deal of alcohol to drink, and they signed the treaty. Uh, when they got back, Black Hawk, who you've heard of, was incensed by the treaty. He was mad at the chiefs for signing it. He was mad at the Americans for forcing them to sign it and uh, contested the treaty for decades. And some say that um, that this treaty ultimately led to the Black Hawk War in the 1830s. Um, not only was there land up here, but there was a great deal of land uh, signed away in Illinois and then up in Wisconsin. Osages gave away, or rather relinquished, claim to all of this land. They also relinquished their claim to all of northern Missouri, um, remember, the little Osages lived in here, and, and the big Osages and little Osages also would sometimes cross into, it wouldn't be uncommon probably to see them hunting around here where we are now. Um, this is 1808, and the, the story there was is that uh, William Clark said, well, if you guys give, us, give up this land, we'll build you this fort. And uh, we not only will we build the, the fort for you, but we will... Um, give, we will establish the aforementioned trading factory that um, George Sibley had. And the Osages thought that'd be a pretty great idea because they said, look, you know, we are so important to the federal government that they're going to build our, us our own fort and they're going to give us our own trading person, our own trading agent. And only later did they discover that it was not just for them, but some of their enemies like the Iowas, the Sac and Fox, the Odos, other tribes would also, would, would also trade there. And then um, I mentioned the Shawnee and Delaware, and Spain actually gave them a land grant before the, uh, the Americans came in. And so um, as part of, the, part of the transfer of power, this land, Spanish land grant was honored, and the Shawnees and Delaware lived here for quite a while and actually did pretty well. They lived, they had lived with some French neighbors. Um, there was a, a great uh, period of sort of intermingling, not only of ideas, but also of marriage and things like that. And they, they really kind of enjoyed a hybrid culture for a time. Um, the Kickapoos were given land here. And 
uh, William Clark set up some land down here for the Shawnees and Delawares. Um, this was not, this land was never ratified by Congress, so it was never an official reservation. But as Americans moved in, uh, the Shawnees and Delawares became increasingly by, by what is this, the 1820s, they became increasingly uncomfortable. And remember I talked about the uh, settlers would, regardless of who owned the land, would often just settle on it. And so I think there were 1,600 Shawnees and Delawares lived here. And by 1819, I think all but about 400 of them were living over here. So William Clark sort of set them up with their own property. Uh, and then this land up here was a Kickapoo reservation, which um, was ratified. And so, th and uh, one of the reasons that these tribes, the Shawnee, Delaware, and Kickapoo, were moving in from other places in the country further east is because they were had been receiving for years pressure from white settlers, uh, even before the United States became a country. They'd been, um, you know, their own land. I mean, the Delawares came from New Jersey originally, and so they had um, had a long history of being pushed and pushed and pushed until by uh, the 1819, 1820, they were in Missouri. And this what became a problem with you know, groups like the Osages, because then now all of a sudden, not only do they have problems with white settlers, but they've got problems with all of these um, immigrant native nations that are that the US is moving in or sometimes are moving in on their own volition. Um, the Iowa Treaty, Iowa Sack and Fox Treaty of 1824, this is an interesting treaty because it was the first treaty that removed, forcibly removed native tribes from Missouri. Um, the the Iowa's and the Sac and Fox delegations were taken to, to Washington where they, um, you know, I've already mentioned they were treated to, you know, a, great, a, a really nice time, um, showing the military and commercial might of the United States, and then, you know, forced to sign this treaty. When this, but, but because they had relinquished all of northern Missouri, the Iowa's and the Sac and Fox were forced to move uh, out of the state, what was then not part of Missouri. And just outside of St. Joseph, Missouri, there's a little town called Agency, Missouri, and that was the site of the uh, Iowa and Sac and Fox Agency. And like I said, that was the first treaty where, the Iowa, where, where tribes were forced to leave the state. Now, this created a, a certain amount of division within the tribes. Uh, I know within the Iowa's, some people um, did move to the agency, and another group of people really regretted what they had done, and they actually moved up into Iowa, where they still owned some land. Um, okay, the Osages are giving up what land they have left. It, uh, in Missouri, it were, was a strip of about 20-some miles wide, but it also, that treaty also included land in, in um, Arkansas and land in Oklahoma, and, and all the Osages, this was their last huge land session, all the Osages ended up with was a 50-mile strip across the southern border of what is now Kansas. Okay, this is, so the Shawnees, they had, um, like I said, this land had never really been ratified as a reservation by treaty. Uh, the Senate never ratified it. They were removed up to around Kansas City along the, uh, the Kansas River. Followed not long after by the Shawnees who were also moved up, Shawnee Mission, Kansas. They were moved up just outside of Kansas to new land. And then uh, Missouri had always been really interested in this piece of property. You know, the old state border went straight north from the confluence of the Kansas and the Missouri River, straight north. One of the problems with that boundary was uh, this had been set aside, as I mentioned, as a, an Indian territory with the agency outside of St. Joseph. 
but settlers could easily pretend ignorance about this border because it was an imaginary line. And federal troops were sent in to try to remove settlers who were living here, even though it was land supposedly set aside for indigenous people. But all they had to do was say, well, we didn't realize that you know this invisible line was five miles east of us. Okay, We thought we were still in Missouri. So um, in 1830, uh, there was a huge treaty at Prairie, Prairie du Chien, and it mostly had to do with land in Iowa. But part of it, the Iowa and the Sac and Fox um, agreed to give up land up here in Iowa, but part of it extended down here. And later, the Iowa's claimed not to have understood the treaty because a, an a, a interpreter was not provided for them. And so they contest, contested the treaty, refused to leave, uh, and in fact were allowed to stay for a while. Okay, the Kickapoos are gone now. Um, they claim never to have really liked Missouri that much anyway. They were never happy with their land. And so they were given land up, uh, there was a Kickapoo. The Kickapoos are still there, actually. They were given land up here, kind of by St. Joseph, Missouri. So now the Osages have been removed from Missouri. The Kickapoos had been removed from Missouri. The Shawnee and Delaware had been removed from Missouri. And so this removal, and, and we're not even really quite up to, well, we're just up to 1830. We always think of removal, the Removal Act of 1830 as the start of all of that, but really removal had been going on since the time of, of Thomas Jefferson. One thing I want to talk about, this little uh, Kickapoo reservation was kind of uh, interesting because this is the only reservation that the, it was given to an immigrant tribe, a tri in other words, a tribe not originally from Missouri, by the United States government, okay? There was this little reservation over here, but that had been given to the uh, Shawnee and Delaware, Delaware by the Spanish government. So William Clark actually had to go to Congress and have the law changed to allow the Kickapoos to sell land that had been given to them by a Senate ratified treaty. And it, it, it took a while, but they got it done. And then in 1836, sort of the final, final piece of the jigsaw puzzle comes together, and that is the Iowa's um, Actually, there were, there were two treaties. The Iowa's and the, the Sac and Fox signed one treaty to, this is called, known as the Platt Purchase Treaty, maybe you've heard that, um, that phrase. But the, the Iowa's and the Sac and Fox signed one treaty, and then uh, some of the tribes that had lived up in Nebraska, uh, including the Odo's, Potawatomi's, uh, other tribes, signed a separate treaty. What's kind of interesting is the government was in such a hurry to remove tribes that while the U.S. was moving uh, the, all the, uh, the Iowa's and the Sac and Foxes out of here, another treaty that took place in Chicago was moving Potawatomi's into here. And so that all had to get sorted out when, when um, the United States senators from Missouri saw that come up before the Indian Committee. They had to get it straightened out. And here's where everybody ended up. Um, I, I mentioned the reservations, and this gives you a little better idea. Okay, so we've got Odo's and Missouri's up here in Nebraska, uh, Iowa, Sac and Fox, very small reservations up here, uh, the Delawares, Kansas or Kaws, Shawnees, Kansas City would be about right here. There's the Kickapoo Reservation. Osages, I have this wrong. I've got it a couple of miles south of the Kansas border, but actually it should be a couple of miles north of the Kansas border. Uh, Chickasaws here, Quapaws and Shawnees. And you notice that um, the Sac and Foxes and the uh, Shawnees have two different, um, you know, two different uh, reservations and kind of sometimes the whole process of treating with the United States government would fraction, fractionalize or, you know, factionalize, there we go, factionalize 
tribes because generally you would have part of the tribe that was assimilationist and they were willing to go along with the U.S., but you would have other parts uh, of the tribes who were not and they wanted to just keep living the way they had always lived. And in fact, um, some of the Kickapoos ended up going to Mexico and there are Kickapoos in Mexico today. And that's why, because they thought they could go down there and live the way they wanted to live. And this is what the map looks like today. You can see, even after they were removed, a lot of the land was, a lot of the land was diminished. A lot of the nations moved into uh, Oklahoma, what was called the, um, what was called the Indian Territory. And so this is, this is where the situation we have today. Um, this is not history, really. This is a story that is still ongoing. Um, just in September, the Osages announced that they, actually the Osages own a lot of land in Missouri. Um, they own a, 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 one of the last burial mounds left in St. Louis. They own some land in, uh, I think, Butler County where they have, um, some of their ancestors are buried. But they bought land at the Lake of the Ozarks. And in September, they, meant, they said that they, um, they announced this land purchase. They bought 23 acres and they have since um, um, released the location of it. And it's just, just up uh, above Bagnell Dam at the Lake of the Ozarks. And what they wanted to do at the time that this was first mentioned, this is Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear, who is the, the elected head chief of the Osages in Oklahoma. He wouldn't say at that time what the parcel would be used for. They have since admit, um, come out and announced officially that they want to set, build a casino at the Lake of the Ozarks. But they want the land in Missouri, this is the important thing, they want the land in Missouri to be recognized as part of their reservation area. And they want the principles of the McGirt court case to apply to land the nation's jurisdictional holdings in Missouri. Um, I don't know, you may have heard about the McGirt case, and it's really complicated, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'll try and quickly summarize. And um, uh, it, it was a, uh, a court case that had to do with who's got jurisdictions when crimes are committed and in major crimes are committed on Indian land, and they found out that um, you know, the state of Oklahoma had been prosecuting and handling major crimes in land that the Creeks or the Muscogees had claimed as their own. And McGurk says that this one sentence here is kind of the crux of it. It says that Congress established reservations by treaty, remember all, all reservations were, uh, had to be ratified by the Senate. So Congress established these reservations and over the years, even though in treaties, the tribes had sold their land, Congress had never disestablished the treaties. This is a purely legal hair to split, okay? But the Osages, I think, are seeing uh, the door cracked and they're kind of wanting to use that principle to have land in Missouri claimed as part of their reservation. And that's the only way they could build a, 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 um, build a casino in Missouri. So I don't know what's gonna happen. As I said, this has just been um, developing in the last few months. But I think you're going to see more tribes re-establishing some sort of relationship with Missouri, whether they're able to actually get land they own here, uh, classified by the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs, who has the only, the only organization that's got the authority to do that, they could establish a reservation. Could, so so this, this whole thing is still ongoing. We think about it as history, but it's still ongoing. And here's the final bookend of the, uh, we, we saw the John Gast painting at the beginning, and this is something that was just created, I think, this year for the Indian Land Tenure Group, and it's the white buffalo calf woman uh, bringing back the health and vitality 
of the land and the people, and it kind of has to do with land back where that optimism of the white people moving across, you know, east to west has faded, and um, you know, it's it's a pretty dystopian land that the, the, the artist is visualizing that we white folks have left. And so they're bringing the buffalo back, they're bringing indigenous people back. The white buffalo calf woman has, was the, 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 the story goes, the woman who brought the uh, sacred pipe to the Lakota people. So things are moving, things are changing. And if you have questions, if you're interested in some of my notes or sources, uh, John mentioned the article in July that this was based on, and also you can feel free to email me if you want to. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.